Welcome in to another edition of Talking Ducks. Oregon escapes out of Lubbock with an impressive victory over Texas Tech. That'll set up a matchup against Hawaii before they get to conference play. Eight teams in the Pac-12 ranked in the top 25. Is it the best conference in the country? And we'll take a closer look as far as what Oregon needs to clean up in their final game before they enter Pac-12 play. But let's go ahead and get to Made of Metal, brought to you by Leatherman. And we'll welcome in the crew here. Joey Harrington, who did not go to New York to replace Aaron Rodgers. Anthony Newman, who still will not let his son play for Deion Sanders. And Aaron Fentress, who is with the Oregonian, of course. And let's start with you, Aaron. What's up? This was a nail-biter in Lubbock. There were times where you thought Oregon might lose this game and really stub their toe as far as college football playoff hopes or everything that they have aspirations for. But what did you take away from this? How lucky was Oregon to survive this game that really felt like that matchup against Washington State last year? You know, last week, I think all of us felt like this is a game the Ducks should roll in. If, you, if you're going to be serious contenders for the conference or our playoff berth, you should be able to take care of Texas Tech pretty easily. But as I said last week, that Vegas line came out. I was like, whoa, seven and a half moved to six. That means most people believed that Texas Tech was going to at least cover it, and it turned out to be that type of game. So if you're going to end up in close games like this, which it looks like they're going to be, you have to have the stones to pull these things out. And if we go back to last year, you had the Washington State game, you had the Utah game, North Carolina game. Now they blew the Oregon State game, but I still believe they beat UW if Bo Nix doesn't get injured. So I think what we saw was a situation where th this team is not dominant. They have not shown last year or this year or even two years ago that it's a dominant team. If you're not going to be dominant, you got to be able to pull things out in the stretch, down the, down the stretch of the clutch, and that's what they did. Joey, was this a game Oregon should have won when you look at the way that they played with the penalties and some of the mistakes? Or were they fortunate that Texas Tech just made some head-scratching errors down the stretch? No, you said the right word right there, penalties. Aaron, how many penalties do they have against your Vikings? One? One. And that was I mean, home they, cooking. How many, so yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was, um, yeah. How many penalties I'm do they still have bitter. this week? <laughs> I don't Anthony, know how, how many they have. 14. 14. Damn. It was like eight at halftime, right? They had nine at halftime. Nine at Four, halftime? Four, you, can't, you can't do that. I mean, yeah, you can look at it and say, like, like, the way that you have to look at this is they committed 14 penalties. That is more penalties than a good football team has in three games, right? They are literally, lead, you know, after having one penalty the first week, they are, after week two, are leading the conference in penalty number and penalty yards. To have that type of, we'll call it brain farts, and still win, I think, like, like um, Aaron said, it says something about, about their guts. It says something about the fortitude of, uh, of this team. It says something about Bo as a leader. Um, but, yeah, if you are going to compete, you know, it's interesting because we looked at that at Texas Tech game at the start of the season and said this could be a game that potentially, like you look back on at the end, it could be like a defiant, like, hey, look at that good win against Texas Tech on the road. Now you look at it and say, okay, great, we survived. We, <laughs> what about the seven games that we have coming up in our conference that are going to be against top 25 teams? Like th this game, when you look at it at the end of the season, is going to be a blip, is going to be a whew, okay. We survived, we moved on. But the thing for me is you have to clean up those pen. Dion isn't gonna let you win a game with, with 14 penalties. Caleb Williams isn't gonna let you win a game with 14 penalties. Michael Penix isn't gonna, like, this isn't gonna be sustainable if Oregon wants to do what they want to do. And that's, that's really it. I mean, because you can break it down and say, well, well they didn't score a, a touchdown in the second or third quarter, and they scored no points in the third. Penalties, like you shoot yourself in the foot over and over and over. You put yourself in bad situations, that's the result. When you don't, you're able to, well, not necessarily win every game 81 to seven, but you know, <laughs> it's a little bit easier to roll. Anthony, is this the type of game that, as a coach is almost the perfect recipe for what you need, and you've been in this situation. You know there's a lot of things your team needs to clean up. You have a game that exposes those things on film that you can now teach but you still get the victory. Do you feel like this is one of those games for Oregon that will really help this team identify some areas that they could kind of gloss over in a victory against Portland State, but
but that you absolutely need to clean up as you get set for this Pac-12 gauntlet. Well, as a coach, I think you look at your team and say, okay, we can win dealing with adversity. And that's what happened. <laughs> they dealt with a lot of adversity. And Joey just was spot on with the penalties. I mean, you can't beat an, an opponent and then beat yourself. You're playing two teams. You only need to play one. And, and so there's no way you're going to win, you know, games that are or, or, or teams that can really play uh, like USC. You know, you're talking about the, the Buffaloes. That's going to be a dogfight if you have 14 penalties. There, there's no way. But adversity to me is big because that's a part of football. That's a part of life, as we know. But it's a part of football during the game. And, and, and what's the next play all about? Can you can you mess up and then go to the next play and make a big play for your team and help your team out? Even though you messed up, you know, previous plays. That's 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 a part of the game. That's four quarters of football. That's why there's four quarters when people talk about, well, yeah, they played good the first half, but they played, you know, they played okay the second half. No, it's four quarters of football. So if you keep playing, you make mistakes, can you come back from that and make adjustments during halftime to play better in the second half? And I think Oregon did that. To wrap this up, Aaron, how should Duck fan feel after this game? Is this a, wow, we committed all these mistakes and we still won, look at how good we can be? Or is this one of those games, okay, they moved the ball on us, we're pretty lucky to get out of there. There are a lot of questions about this team still. Absolutely. You cannot believe after what you saw that this is a front runner to win the conference. However, I believe you take away the fact that it is you know, Texas, Texas, Texas is a quality program and you're on the road and it's not an easy place to play. And you were down 28, 17 in the second half and you found a way to win. So that's encouraging. But like you mentioned before, Joey mentioned, you got seven ranked teams coming up, I think. You eight. would probably have seven. Well, yeah, there's eight teams in the conference. They right? don't play UCLA this they year. They don't. Only yeah, six. so six, so six coming up. That's probably going to mean at least four more games like this, at least if not five or six. And so when you play a lot of close games, guess what's eventually going to happen? You're going to trip up and lose a couple, which is what happened last year, which is what happened has happened in the past with this program when they've had maybe playoff berth within their grasp. So I think you just have to hope that this is just a step in the right direction that they got the win and that they're able to fix these mistakes, the penalties, the issues on defense, the run game. What happened to the run game? It just disappeared in this game. But this is still a very good football team and fun to watch. All right, stick around when we come back. We'll take a closer look. Bo Nix really putting things into his own hands and legs as he was helping Oregon get the win. This Oregon defense underneath Dan Lanning's second year, are there areas where this team can still improve? And then we give some love to Camden Lewis, just getting started here on this edition of Talking Ducks. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back to Talking Ducks. Time now for our legendary performance, brought to you by Abby's Legendary Pizza and Bo Nix, winning Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Week awards with his performance against Texas Tech, and Joey, this is a game where Oregon needed Bo to be Bo, and that's exactly what he did, used his arms and legs, the running game was lacking against Texas Tech, but Mo Bo made enough plays on offense, despite the penalties, to help Oregon get the win down the stretch, so what did you see from him? Because it's one thing when you have a close game, but to go on the road in a non-conference game early in the season, you've been there before, these are tough games to gut out, and you have to have great play from your quarterback. Yeah, he won the game. I mean, his play, his consistency, his um, <clears throat> him being him, he, it, that, that is, that's who we've seen, that's what we've seen from Bo Nix from the moment he arrived in Eugene. We've come to expect that. I'm going to maybe transition and ask a little question, though. Like, what we've also come to expect is a really solid running game, right? And Bo, even if he goes out and plays like this every single weekend, they're not going to win all of the games unless they have the running game that we're so used to. And, and, and I have a, you know, my question in watching this was... Is this a product of all the penalties putting him in bad positions? You know, maybe longer, longer yardage situations behind the change. You got to throw the ball more. Or is this a, a, a 
a product of an offensive line that's tr still trying to figure themselves out, right? This was a group last year that, you know, dominated the line of scrimmage, allowed one sack, and that was only when Bo tripped, right? You know, Bucky Irving broke out, Noah Whittington broke out because these offensive linemen were opening massive holes. Not that they didn't play well against Texas Tech, but they weren't the explosive players that we've seen. And so my question, yeah, Bo, Bo is Bo. We know what we're going to get from him. And for the next 12 weeks, we're probably going to get that, on a, you know, another 10 times. There's going to be a couple times when you're going to have to rely on your running game. You're going to have to. It, it's going, it, I mean, that, that's, that's what happens during the course of a season. You can't do it every single week and expect to win. And so I'm curious to see <clears throat> against Hawaii, you know, I'd like to see a similar dominance that we saw against Portland State, but I'm really curious to see once this Pac-12 season starts against Colorado, if the, if the game against Texas Tech rushing-wise is going to be the rule or what's the, you know, what's the, what, what's the phrase I'm forgetting? Is this the... Standard? Yeah, I mean, it is exception to the rule. Exception, yeah, the rule. exception to the rule. Exactly. We're a sharp bunch. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Man, you don't want to see got, us. On I got like a night. peanut, like a peanut fragment stuck in my throat. So oh, I was like, man. I couldn't think of it because I got like. <laughs> oh, hey, I, I I'm distracted. Really Go right to somebody else. I don't have a glass of water here. <laughs> uh, you know, Aaron. One more thing on Bo Nix before we go to Anthony on the defense here. With this running game, it's interesting. A lot of folks that had watched the wide twenty two said. The receivers were wide open for Oregon for the majority of the night. And you also look at the fact that they were behind the chains on so many of these drives because of the penalties. I imagine that plays a hand in the ineffectiveness of the running game that we saw this past Saturday. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things you can point to. But I, like I'm looking here, the bottom line is Bucky Irving, 11 carries, 40 yards. That's, you know, 3.5 per carry, whatever. He averaged six plus last year. We know that. Whittington, seven carries for 21 yards. Jordan James, four carries for 12 yards. So regardless of all the other variables, the bottom line is that when they handed the ball to a back, the production wasn't there. I'm not going to throw the offensive line on the bus after one game, especially against a team that's pretty good and has been pretty good against the run. And the, you know, the situation played out the way it played out with the penalties, et cetera, and the, and the fact that the passing game was there, the passing game was there. So you're going to go heavy passing, which only makes sense. But still... Still, you're going to need that running game to get back to last year's levels if you want to win this conference because you can't always put it all on Bo. That said, after UCLA, you yeah, after UCLA last <laughs> year, you know, I know, fire, too? <laughs> after UCLA last year, I was sold on Bo being that dude. And other than the Oregon State game, he really has never not entered the call in a duck uniform. So even at 28-17, I just kept waiting waiting for him to click, and boom, he did. He's so smart. He's so confident. That, this is fifth year, guys, right? Because of that COVID year, he got a fifth year. Joey, what would you have been like in a fifth year? Like, you give a guy five years starting in college, you should be completely a master of your situation, and he definitely is. Anthony, hopefully you can save us this segment here. Let's get to the defense. Opportunistic. I mean, you couldn't ask for more as far as big-time plays when Oregon needed it, especially with Texas Tech in the red zone, but they were still able to move the ball pretty freely against this defense, and you look at this with a keen eye. I mean, how do you dissect the defense after this performance? There's some good and there's some bad, but, you know, what do we need to learn from them still? Well, give the Red Raiders some props. They have a good offense. They have some receivers. They got two tight ends that are monsters. One guy's 6'8", one guy's 6'6". I mean, it's a matchup problem, you know, and, and, and Tyler was, was doing a great job at the quarterback position for them. He was, he was leading that offense with his legs uh, as well as his arm. So give them credit. You know, when, when I look at a defense, I'm looking for improvement from each from game to game. Okay, did they get better? That's, that's what you want to look at because it's, just, it's still the beginning of the season. So last week, when you talk about Portland State, ah, yeah, our defense looked so-so. And then you look at it this game. The game's much closer. It's a dogfight. And you're going, well, you know, the defense, man, they suck. They, they, they're terrible. What's going on? Well, let's, let's think about this for a minute. You know, the defense in this game, it, they had five TFLs, tackle for loss, okay? Last week, they had three. And two of those were by, by corners, defensive backs on the outside, 
tackling uh, bubble screens, okay? This game, it was all interior guys. Getting, playing on the other side of the ball, okay? Quarterback, let's get to the quarterback. Okay, this game, they had four sacks. Last game, they had zero. This game, interceptions. They had three interceptions. Last game, they had zero. Okay, forced fumbles. This game, two. Last game, zero. Is that not improvement? Okay, you but scored. hold up. But hold you, you, Forrest stayed through wait, the ball wait, like no, eight wait, times. Wait, no, 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 no. It's not you. It's me. It's me. Now, here's another thing. They scored on defense. <laughs> they scored on defense. Now, you got all these people talking about, all these people talking about, oh, you know, well, no, they're not good enough. They're not good enough. Dan Lanning's in his second year. He's moving pieces around. It takes time. Rome wasn't built overnight. It takes time. You're going to have mistakes. But if you're getting better from week to week, that's what you're looking for. And I got, you got all these experts out there talking about what they should be doing. And the defense sucks. I get so, so mad. But I, you know what? I got to say, look, here's the deal. <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking to a drunk person in a bar. He doesn't understand. He has no clue. He works at Nordstrom's. He's selling shoes. And he's trying to tell me about computer components. He's an expert. Everybody's an expert. But you don't know what Dan Landing is doing behind closed doors. You don't know what's going on when they're meeting 12 hours a day dealing with the defense. Let it play out. They're getting better every game, and that's what you want to see. Okay, let me support, let me support Anthony well, on this. I was just going to say real quick, Aaron, in, in years past, Anthony, you would just say they're getting better. So I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that but hold on. Let me, let me, rant I, I, let me, let about me that. But Aaron, go ahead. I, I said, at the, beginning of, said at the beginning of the season that I'm going to harp on sacks and pressure all year, right? They got four sacks. They only had 18 last year. So even though Shuck did some things, Shuck did some things under a lot of duress. And we saw the interceptions, and then we saw what happened. Well, it was an interception, but at the end, what happened? They didn't sack him, but they got pressure. They got in his face. The ball gets tipped, pick six to the house. So the defense, regardless of the stats in the run game or whatever, made enough plays to win that game, period. All right. Wait, 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 wait. hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Did, did Aaron and Anthony just agree? <laughs> you gave so. me a dirty look, so I decided I'd pull that out of my backside <laughs> so I wouldn't get jumped like later. Friendship? <laughs> All right, things are moving along here. When we come back, Dan Lanning will address some areas of improvement for this Oregon team as they get set to take on Hawaii more after the break. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Leading back to Saturday night, you know, that, that flight, it was a mixed emotion flight, right? We were extremely excited. I was really uh, proud of our team's poise and our coach's poise throughout that game, um, but also acknowledging all the things that, that we put in ourselves in and the situations we put ourselves in within that game. Um, but to be able to come out of that place in a hostile environment with a win uh, and a lot of things that we always talk about, Monday's our day to go to the doctor. We were able to go to the doctor and acknowledge a lot of things. Um, you know, one, one being especially the penalties there in the game, you know, something we address. First thing we put up in front of our players today is, you know, a penalty and then acknowledging how that drive finished when we had a penalty within that drive, right? So false start, punt, false start, punt, false start, punt, right? Um, pass interference, touchdown, pass interference, touchdown, pass interference. So really just recognizing like if we eliminate some really um, – careless errors and, and figure out ways to drill those things in practice, it's going to make us a completely different team. Um, and I think that game could look a lot different. That being said, you know, I think uh, Texas Tech had a great plan and they did some some really good things that challenged us that we're going to be able to build off of and we've already attacked how we can get better. Um, but moving forward from that game, Hawaii, really excited about this matchup. I think it provides um, some fun opportunities. There's a lot of players on our team, you know, from the islands. Um, that are, that are here, and this game means a lot to them. Um, certainly a, a team that we have a lot of respect for. There's also some unique opportunities this week for our fans to contribute back to um, some of uh, the people involved and in what happened at Lahaina and Maui as well. So I know that'll be you know something working with Marcus Mariota's uh, foundation, uh, Justin Herbert and Sabrina. They all have some pieces where you have an opportunity to give back. I know us as a team um, are also collecting some clothing and, and – uh, finding things that we can do to help give back um, to those people as well. 
Well, that was Dan Lanning from practice on Monday, and obviously some areas to clean up after that close win against Texas Tech. And guys, we've talked it ad nauseum, offensive line penalties, defense, whatever you want to say, which is almost every aspect of the game. But now they come back home. You take on Hawaii before we get to the Pac-12. And Aaron, what do you want to see out of Oregon against Hawaii? The Ducks are opening up as 38-point favorites. You imagine Hawaii is not going to be able to put up much of a fight against Oregon. How do you prepare yourself best to be playing your optimal football for conference play by getting one more chance to really sharpen things up against Hawaii? I want to see whatever Newman wants to see. (laughs) (laughs) um, (laughs) I think the number one thing is better discipline, better overall discipline, clean up the penalties, you know, try and have a game where you're seven or fewer. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a reasonable request. Obviously, you want to be healthy. And this is not a good Hawaii team. You want one penalty. Joey wants one. This Hawaii team's already lost to Vanderbilt and Stanford. Great academic schools, not necessarily great football programs right now, although Stanford used to be. Um, so you, sh- you should cover that spread, stay healthy, clean up the penalties, everything else. I mean, they're going to get sacks. They're going to get turnovers. They're going to probably run for 260. You know, they're not going to get much resistance. So just better overall discipline. Joey. I think um, after Anthony's extremely moving and passionate speech, um, you know, I talked at the beginning of the season about needing to get a pass rush or get pressure on a quarterback with only a front four, right? That's, you're going to have to when you're playing Caleb Williams and Mike Penix and Cam Rising and, you know, you literally go down the, the list of quarterbacks, Shador Sanders, very, very soon. They didn't pressure the quarterback against Portland State. They did against Texas Tech. I want to see pressure. I want to see Hawaii's quarterback. I want to see him on skates. I want to see those O-linemen literally like just on on skates running. I want to see this guy running for his life because that is going to have to happen in two weeks against Colorado. It's going to have to. I mean, that's going to be the difference in that ball game is which defense comes up with the big plays, comes up with the turnovers, comes up with the, the strip fumble, the sack and on, on third and long. Like that, that's going to have to become the norm for this, for this defense, for this front four especially. So I want to see him. I didn't see it against Portland State. Um, I want to see it against Hawaii. Show us, show us you got it. You're right, Anthony. It was, it was significantly improved. Um, now let's see if we can do it, you know, week to week. And, and especially against a team that, that you should be dominating up front. Anthony, what do you need to see so that you can uh, tell the drunk guy that works at Nordstrom's apparently um, <laughs> that he needs to learn about football? <laughs> well, uh, maybe start coaching at a high school. I don't, I don't know. Uh, and start, tra- you know, learn the game a little bit. Did this really I, I, happen, I, by the way? Or is... No, it didn't happen. <laughs> That's true. You, yeah, you won't see me there, but um, no, you know, I, I think when, when as a coach again, I always, you know, since I'm coaching high school football, I, I'm always thinking about this as a coach and I'm looking for improvement in different areas. So when you had some issues during Texas Tech, uh, it was third, uh, well, third down situations for the Oregon's defense. You know, the Red Raiders are seven of 12. You got to get off the field for the defense. So you have to improve uh, in that area. You know, the penalties. Joey talked about that. You, you cannot beat yourself, you know. And then, and then going against, uh, you know, Hawaii, it's, it's got to be like Portland State. You, you got to roll them. You got to take care of business. And then the most important thing is come out healthy. Get everybody healthy and get ready to go because you got a game after that one. Healthy, fewer penalties. Defense applying a little bit of pressure. Pretty easy recipe for Oregon as they take on Hawaii, but obviously some things to clean up. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about the Pac-12. Is it the best conference in all of America right now with eight teams in the top 25? We'll let you know when we return on Talking Ducks. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back to Talking Ducks. Time now for some talking numbers brought to you by Par Lumber. And how about the Pac-12, baby? 
I got a record eight teams ranked right now. In the top 10, you have number five USC and number eight Washington. They have three more ranked teams than any other conference. In the Pac-12 right now, 20 and three combined non-conference record, four and three against power five opponents. And so, Aaron, with this information, eight teams in the top 25, which is fitting for this final season. If only you could kind of keep these 12 teams together for an extended television deal. How does this change the expectations for Oregon? Because this ain't what anybody signed up for coming into this season, having to go through six ranked teams potentially during conference play. Yeah, we were looking at Oregon State, USC, UW, and Utah and going, uh-oh. And now you got to throw Colorado in there and maybe Washington. It's just getting pretty dangerous looking, right? So I had Texas Tech as a losable game, and I dropped them as a losable game. Now I got Colorado as a clearly losable game because they got a dude at quarterback who can just change everything that you're trying to do on defense and flip it on its ear and, and make you look like a fool. So that's scary. I'm still at 9-3, though. You know, I came in 9-3. I'm going to stay 9-3. I think they can get through that gauntlet winning at least half of those tough games, but I still have them with three losses because it's going to be super tough to get through that list of teams when they're all so good at quarterback. Well, most. Most of them are. Yeah, and Joey, you mentioned the quarterbacks. The coaching that we're seeing in this conference as well, too, is probably at an all-time high. And you look at Oregon and really the expectations as far as what is a successful season. Is it still Pac-12 title or bust? Or do you understand that now the road's gotten that much more difficult, so you're going to have a little bit more of an understanding if the Ducks don't go 10-2 and or 11-1? and That's dumb. Why would you say that? <laughs> Well, thanks. Come on. <laughs> I will make a note. Is it ever there. okay, Jordan, not to go to 11 and 1? Is it ever okay not to challenge for a conference championship? Come on. Um, I guess understandable <laughs> if they don't accomplish those goals. Yeah, he's not saying um, don't go for it. He's saying, yeah, you're obviously, you shoot don't for it. Yeah. No, you don't ever Win say, well, sometimes. I guess it's okay that we didn't get there. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> nobody, like. <sighs> Nobody cares. At the end of the year, nobody's going to sit there and say, oh, you know what, that tough game against Washington State. Oh, boy. Like, they're going to sit there and say, well, the SEC is just the best in the world, and look at all the games that they like. Nobody cares that you have to play six ranked teams. Nobody cares that the Pac-12 is the best that it's been in 100 years. Nobody cares about that stuff. All they care about is did you win the conference? Did you go to the playoffs? Did you, like, that, that's it. And so the focus doesn't change. It just means the road got a little bit harder. The, the reason for me that I, I said they would go 11-1 and one is because the games, that they, the difficult games they had, like, like Aaron talked about, Utah and UW were on the road, Oregon State and SC were at home. I said they win the, uh, they win the home games and they split the road games. The two new games that are, you know, losable, like Aaron likes to say, are Colorado and Washington State, both of which are at home. So I put them in the win the home, you know, win the close game at home category. They still go 11 and 1. They don't care that there's more teams that are difficult, Jordan. They don't care. No, it's not acceptable. Go win the championship. Wait, That's wait, that. wait. Is Joey saying they're going to go 11 and 1? I Is said that, that at the start that. of the season. Yes, I did. 11 and 1. 11 and 1 and maybe one of the toughest schedules in the country here. Anthony, your thoughts on this revamped Pac-12 that has everybody seemingly punching above their weight class nearly three games into the season? Uh, as Herm Edwards said, you play the win to the, win the game, uh, you know. So, yeah, you're, Joey's right. You know, you, you, you're going for, 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 the, for the whole thing. Uh, and it's going to be strange that if a team from the Pac-12 is playing in the national championship game, I mean, come on. I mean, I, I'm, still, I'm still shook over this whole thing about this thing is disappearing. I, I really am. And that's a whole other topic. But right now, Oregon has their hands full. And they have their hands full because you're going against a bunch of Pac-12 teams that can score a lot of points. They have a lot of dynamic players on their team. And it's going to start in a couple of weeks, <laughs> going to get Sanders, the quarterback. There's so many quarterbacks in, this, in the Pac-12. It's unreal. And how do you slow them down? Uh, Dan Lanning has his <laughs> – he's got his work cut out, cut out for him. It's going to be interesting how this thing works. He's going to have to earn yeah, that Yeah, now you look at this Colorado this matchup, year. Aaron, and 
this is a game I feel like if you had bought tickets for last season, you got the tickets for free if you bought burgers and fries at a local place. But now, they're going for $500, sold out. The game is going to be ooh, prime ooh. time and Jordan. the middle of the day, Jordan. which is noon. And it's going to be a huge game. Your thoughts on just how this has completely changed this part of the season for Oregon? $53,000 is the most expensive ticket. For the fifty-three thousand dollars is the least expensive ticket. Is the most expensive. 50, most expensive 53, ticket. Fifty-three thousand dollars. Do you get a call to play with that? <laughs> Do you get to throw a ball? <laughs> you go ahead. Go ahead. There's. I just. I just saw that today. I was like fifty-three. Fifty-three thousand dollars. <laughs> and I love the ducks, but <laughs> Aaron, unless go I'm ahead. calling plays, I'm not. <laughs> go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> Uh, I remember the question now. <laughs> Say it again. Ask, me, ask the question again. I'm blown away here. I said just how much this matchup against Colorado has changed. Oh, from dude, in April when we were looking at this versus. I'm gonna now. be unbearable next week. I'm gonna save a lot of what I have to say, but I'm gonna say one thing. <laughs> I'm gonna say one thing. Dan Lanning threw some shade at Colorado. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who's last time they won anything? Yeah. Who cares if they're leaving? And then of course Oregon left too. But he can't lose that game. If he loses that game, Deion Sanders might do his end zone dance on the up. Like, he's going to talk. <laughs> Deion did not. What did Deion say? I keep receipts. He, uh -huh. I bet he has Dan Lanning talking trash on loop and plays it every night before he goes to bed. So, Dan Lanning, you cannot lose at home to Deion Sanders. You will never hear the end of it. I love college football. I love college football. All right. I forgot about that. We'll talk some that, more Anthony. college football, speaking of which, with Dan Rubenstein. When we come back, we'll break down more about the depth of the Pac-12 and what he sees from the Ducks. He'll join us from the Solid Verbal when we return on Talking Ducks. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back to Talking Ducks. Time now to catch up with our good friend Dan Rubenstein from the Solid Verbal. And Dan, it was a wild weekend in college football, but fortunately, Oregon fans were treated to arguably the game of the week. That was Oregon against Texas Tech. And you look at how close this was and the way that it shook out. And what was your most impressive thing about this game? And then maybe the most disappointing thing about this game when you look back at it now? So the worst thing is the undisciplined nature of both the offense and the defense, right? It's the starting out at first and 15, first and 20 because of quick holding calls or because of backbreaking holding calls in the red zone or because of false starts from a, uh, I would say, an inexperienced offensive line together. Uh, and then defense, like you saw, I, I thought the pass rush was really good. If, if I was going to take away any single great thing from this game... It was the ability of this Oregon defensive line to get pressure on Tyler Shuck, obviously forcing the play of the game and that pick six to, to Jeffrey Bassa to sort of cinch things or hopefully cinch things because Texas Tech got the ball back. But no, I, I thought the most encouraging thing was the uh, the pass rush from the line and the most discouraging thing was, look, when you when you commit that many penalties, you're just tying a hand behind your back. And so that was the discouraging thing from Oregon that like, that that's something that can't happen against Utah, USC, Colorado, Washington, all of these schools because there is an element of competition that like there's so much back and forth between what we what we believe to be tight competition between those matchups that you you start out giving yourself uh a a handicap. You're just you're kind of done in terms of what you can do against those teams. Dan, now that we're truly a game into the season, because I don't know if you can really count that game against Portland State, right? have your expectations or what you want to see from Oregon changed, or do we still need a larger body of work after this game? Uh, every game against a real team shifts things somewhat, and so I'm a little bit more worried about the linebackers than I think I was. We'll see what happens when uh, Justin Jacobs comes back healthy. Obviously, he comes with a, a lot of fanfare in terms of ceiling, uh, but they struggled a little bit against the run, and so against USC, against Utah, that's a little bit worrisome. Washington doesn't run the ball, so that's at least okay, but also there's some concerns just about the linebackers in general, so that's concerning. Um I thought, and I saw a lot of the the all 22 angles of where the offense was, there were a lot of open Oregon receivers in this game. And so 
that at least gives me a little bit of uh, optimism about where this offense is heading because there were guys running free. There were big short yardage moments that should have been a lot easier running backs that didn't follow fullbacks when they should have or tight ends that appeared open in the end zone. And so I thought Bo Nix looked a little bit tight in this moment. So it actually gives me encouragement that this wasn't an offensive scheme thing. This was a maybe a one game thing because I'm still very confident in Bo Nix hitting open receivers in big games because he's shown it before. All right, Dan, you've got eight. Yes, eight teams out of the Pac-12. That's 75% of the conference in the top 25. Do you feel that this is the best conference in the country, even though you don't have a team in the top four, but when you look at the overall depth of what the Pac-12 is putting out there right now? I think in, in this moment, with the data that we have, with what the Big Ten and the top of the Big Ten hasn't done in terms of playing quality teams. Obviously, Ohio State has Notre Dame here in a couple weeks. Uh, Michigan, it's going to be a while before they play, I think, a solid to a a good team. Uh, Penn State showed what a good team should do against West Virginia, but still they have a ways to go before they play quality teams. So I think the Big Ten is sort of not in this conversation at the moment because of who they haven't played. Uh, The ACC is looking good, but not great because of where Clemson is. The SEC obviously has started out in a disappointing way with Alabama losing to Texas the way that they have LSU losing to Florida state, the way that they have and Georgia not playing anybody all year long. (laughs) I don't know. So the big 12 is promising, but right now with the depth of quality with what even Arizona, what they were able to do against Mississippi state with that crazy turnover margin and still taking that game to overtime, it's hard to take away moral victories, but if Arizona is in the back half of your conference and taking Mississippi state to overtime, like they did, that's impressive to me. Utah finding ways to win without their starting quarterback, that's impressive to me. So right now, I I would put the performance of the Pac-12's top eight over any other conference's top eight. So if that's your definition of best conference, I think I'm right there with you. Yeah, I like that definition right there, Dan. And now that Colorado has essentially become yeah. the official team of Fox, they'll have another big noon kickoff coming up here around the corner. Let's say they're claimed. Is there another team in the conference that you are hitching your wagon on as far as a team that can maybe make it to the college football playoff or is going to really surprise some people this season? I'm giving Washington a slight edge over USC because I'm going to need to see more from USC's defense. There's a there's stuff about USC's defense that's promising. The turnovers, Bear Alexander has been very productive in terms of generating pressures up front, but... I I was broken last year by giving a little bit of hope to USC that they would get their act together on defense or that the offense would be overwhelming enough to make up for the the USC defense. But what we saw against Utah with an injured Caleb Williams, of course, and then what we saw against Tulane, I'm going to need to see it. I'm going to need to see it on big stages against good teams, whereas with Washington, the way they won their bowl game last year against Texas, the way that they were able to survive the Oregon game when it was looking pretty dicey near the end of that before Bo Nix's injury – Uh, I guess I would tie my, I would hitch my wagon, Dan, Dan sports, uh, Colorado, whatever to Washington, just because of the combination of quarterback pass rush and, uh, that they were able to, to back up the truck for, uh, for Ryan Grubb, their offensive coordinator. So I guess outside, yeah, it it would be between Washington and USC. I'd give Washington the slight edge. So that game is in LA. So I'm still going Washington because you know, you got to plant a flag at some point. All right, one more week of non-conference play before the Pac-12 will inevitably cannibalize itself when it gets to league play. Dan, remind the folks where they can see you at here. Sure, it's the Solid Verbal podcast or it's youtube.com slash at the at sign Solid Verbal. We're recording multiple episodes a week live on Wednesday midday, uh, live on Saturday at night after most of the games, but kind of during Pac-12 after dark right on YouTube. So the Solid Verbal. All right, thanks again. Don't forget, more Talking Ducks when we come back. We'll give you our score predictions as Oregon plays host to Hawaii. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back. Time now for Victory Road, brought to you by Capital Toyota. Your way on the highway. We're closing things up here. And 
Fellas, you look at this matchup against Hawaii, and again, what are your expectations? Oregon's favored by 38. What do you want to see, and how do you think this game's going to go? Aaron, let's start with you. You got a prediction for me? 59-17. That's one of my standard uh, predictions for a matchup like this. As far as what I, what I want to see here, I mean, look, these guys throw the ball a lot. 128 pass attempts in three games, so you're going to get... A lot more practice getting after the quarterback, a lot more practice covering receivers, and a lot of practice not getting a lot of silly penalties uh, just because you're playing a football game. So, hey, that's all I want to see. Clear up some penalties and show that you can get to the quarterback and win by a lot. Joey. 81-7. to seven. Damn! Oh. Oh. <laughs> that's what I want. I want 81-7 to seven with five tackles for loss and three picks. And how many sacks did they have this game uh, against Before Texas Tech? last game. Or this last game, yeah. I want you to combine the defensive uh, points allowed from Portland State with the tackles for loss, sacks, and turnovers of Texas Tech. Anything less than that is a failure. <laughs> it, it's it's going to be a blowout. I'm looking for a blowout. Uh, correct the mistakes from last week uh, and and stay healthy. All right. I've got 66-13 Ducks. I think this is a great warm-up for this matchup against Colorado around the corner. Hawaii throws the ball a ton. Same thing with Colorado. Biggest thing, obviously, just reduce the penalties. These are self-controlled errors, especially the false starts that you got to clean up because, as Joey, you said earlier, you're not going to have that kind of margin with Michael Penix, Caleb Williams, Shador Sanders, a lot of the quarterbacks in this conference. But a chance for Oregon to tighten things up as they get set for one of the most exciting conference openers in recent memory. It'll be Colorado and in Prime there. coming into town here in about a week. But that'll do it for this edition of Talking Ducks. Thanks again for joining us. Don't forget, you can catch us on YouTube. Follow us on at Talking Ducks Show on Twitter and Instagram as well, too. And we'll catch you next time. Oh, where'd you get the extra four? Extra four? Well, if you go 50, set eight touchdowns is 56. And then a 62, you go, oh, you get three is 60. You get 63. Well, nine touchdowns is 63 and then a field goal. field goal, yeah. Okay, there you go. He's cracking on your score predictions, trying to figure out how you arrive at the number. <laughs> like nine wow. touchdowns. He had his hand up the whole time. Like, wait, excuse me? Excuse no, me? No, no, no. Okay, wait. Oh, so we got fajitas and joys or what? Did I misunderstand? The I got to go make my marinade. <laughs>